Hi, everybody. Welcome back to SuperCloud 2. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host, John Furrier. We're here at our tricked out Palo Alto studio. We're going live wall to wall all day. We're inserting a number of, of pre-recorded interviews, folks like Walmart. We just heard from Nir Zook of Palo Alto Networks. And I'm really pleased to welcome in uh, David Flynn. David Flynn, you may know as the one of the people behind Fusion IO, completely changed the way in which people think about storing data, accessing data. Uh, David Flynn, now, now the founder and CEO of a company called Hammerspace. David, good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Good to see and you too. Dr. Nelu Mihai is the CEO and founder of Cloud of Clouds. He's actually built a super cloud. We're going to get into that. Nelu, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year. So I'm going to start right off with a little debate that's going on in the community. If you guys would bring out this slide. So Bob Muglier early today, he, he gave a definition of SuperCloud. He felt like we had to tighten ours up a little bit. He said a SuperCloud is a platform, underscoring platform that provides programmatically consistent services hosted on heterogeneous cloud providers. Now, Nelu, we have this shared doc and you've been in there. You responded, you said, well, hold on. SuperCloud really needs to be an architecture or else we're going to have this Stovepipe of stovepipes, really. And then you, you went on with more detail. What's the information model? What's the execution model? How are users going to interact with SuperCloud? So I, I start with you, why architecture? The inference is that a platform, the platform provider is responsible for the architecture. Why does that not work in your view? Now, the, it's a very interesting question. So whenever you think about platform, what's the connotation? You think about monolithic system. Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether it's true or or not, but there is this connotation of, of uh, monolithic. Um, on the other hand, if you look at what's a problem right now with hyperclouds from the customer perspective, um, they're very complex. There, there is a heterogeneous uh, world where actually every single one of these hyperclouds has the, their own architecture. Uh, you need uh, rocket scientists to build uh, cloud applications. Um, always there is this uh, contradiction between cost and performance. They fight each other. And uh, I'm, I'm quoting here a, a former friend of mine from Bell Labs who work at uh, AWS who used to say, cloud is cheap as long as you don't use it too much. <laughs> so clearly we need something that, that kind of plays from the principal point of view, the role of an operating system that sits on top of this uh, um, heterogeneous hyperclouds, and there's nothing wrong by having this proprietary uh, 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 hyperclouds. Think about processors, think about uh, operating system, and so on and so forth. But in order to be, build a system that is simple enough, I think we need to go deeper and understand. So the argument, the counter argument to that, David, is you'll never get there. You, you need a proprietary system to get to market sooner, to solve today's problem. Now, I don't know where you stand on this platform versus architecture. Well, I haven't asked you, but. I think there are aspects of both, for sure. I mean, it needs to be an architecture in the sense that it's broad-based and, and open and so forth, uh, but you know, platform, uh, you could say, as long as people can instantiate it themselves on their own infrastructure, as long as it's something that can be deployed as you know, software defined, you don't want the concept of platform being the monolith, you know, combined right. hardware and software. So it really depends on what, what you're focused on when you're saying platform. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'd say, you know, as long as it's a software defined thing to where it can literally run anywhere. Because I, mean, I, I really think what we're talking about here is the original concept of cloud computing, the ability to run anything anywhere without having to care about the physical infrastructure. And what we have today is not that. The cloud today is a big mainframe in the sky that just happens to be large enough that once you select which region, generally you have enough resources. But you know, nowadays you don't even necessarily have enough resources in one region and then you're kind of stuck. So we haven't really gotten to that utility model of computing. And you're also asked to rewrite your application, you know, to abandon the conveniences of high performance file access. You got to rewrite it to use object storage stuff. We have to get away from that. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I, I want to just drill on that because I think I like that point about it, there's not enough availability, but on the developer cloud, the original AWS premise was targeting developers, because at that time, 
get the provision of Sunbox, get a Cisco DSU, CSU. Now you get on the cloud, but I think you're bringing up the scale question, because I think right now scale is huge, enterprise grade versus cloud for developers. That's because, right. Because, I mean, look at Amazon, Azure, they got compute, they got storage, they got queuing, and some stuff. If you're doing a startup, you throw your app up there, local host, the cloud, no big deal. It's well, the it, scale thing that gets me. That and you, you can tell by the fact that in regions that are under high demand, right, like in London or LA, at least with the clients we work with in the media and entertainment space, it costs twice as much for the exact same cloud instances that do the exact same amount of work as somewhere out in rural Canada. So why is it you have such a cost differential? It has to do with that supply and demand and the fact that the clouds aren't really the ability to run anything anywhere. Even within the same cloud vendor, you're stuck in a specific region. So. And that was never the original promise, right? I mean, it, it, we turned it into that, but the original promise was get rid of the heavy lifting of IT. Not have and, to run your own IT, yeah, right. exactly. And, and then it became, wow, okay, I can run anywhere. And then, you know, it's like Web 2.0. You know, people say, why SuperCloud? You and I talked about this. Why do you need a name for SuperCloud? It's like Web 2.0. It's what Cloud was supposed to be. It's what Cloud was supposed <laughs> to be, exactly, <laughs> right? <laughs> cloud was supposed to be run anything anywhere, or at least that's what we took it as. But you're right, originally it was just, oh, don't have to run your own infrastructure, and you can choose somebody else's infrastructure. And you did that, but and you're people still said, bound to that And people said, I want more, right? But how do we, how do we go that, from that's, here? That's actually, uh, that's a very good point, because um, indeed, when the first hyperclouds were designed, what is then really focused on customers? So I think supercloud is an opportunity to design in the right way, also having in mind the computer science uh, rigor, and uh, uh, we, should, we should take advantage of that. Because in fact, actually, if cloud would have been designed properly from the beginning, probably wouldn't have needed super You wouldn't cloud. have to have been asked the, to rewrite your application. <laughs> that's correct. To use REST that's interfaces correct. to your storage. <laughs> <laughs> Revisionist history is always a good one. But look, look cloud is great. I and mean, then your point in, uh, is cloud is a good thing. Don't hold it back. It is a very good let thing, Let it actually. continue let to it scale. Let it go as, as it is. Yeah, let that thing continue to grow. Don't impose restrictions on the cloud. Just right. refactor what you need to for scale or enterprise grade or yeah. availability. And you would agree with that. Is that true uh, or totally. is that a problem you're solving? Well, yeah, I mean, it, what the cloud is doing is absolutely necessary. What the public cloud vendors are doing is absolutely necessary. But what's been missing is how to provide a consistent interface, especially to persistent data, and have it be available across different regions and across different clouds, because data is a highly localized thing. Uh, in current architecture, it only exists as rendered by the storage system that you put it in, whether that's a legacy thing like a NetApp or an Isilon or even a cloud data service. It's localized to a specific region of the cloud in which you put that. We have to delocalize data and provide a consistent interface to it across all sites. That's high performance, local access, but to global data. And so Walmart earlier today described their, what we call super cloud, they call it the Walmart cloud native platform. And they use this triplet model, they have AWS and Azure, no, no, oh sorry, no AWS, they have Azure and GCP, mm -hmm. and then on-prem, where all the VMs live. When you, you know, probe, it turns out that it's only stateless in the cloud. <laughs> it's all the state stuff. Well, let, let's, let's just admit it. There is no such thing as stateless because even the application binaries and libraries are state. Well, right? I'm happy that I'm hearing <laughs> yeah. that. Okay. Because okay. actually I, I, I have a lot of debate. But yes, if you think about not, no software running on a phone name or machine is stateless. I exactly. Mean, this is something that was and that's uh, data that needs to be distributed and kind of provided ubiquitous, consistently uh, across and, and all the clouds. Actually, it's a nonsense. But so it's an illusion. Okay. Well, right. that, no, it, the guys talk about stateless. Well, it, it, see, people uh, make the confusion between state and persistent state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Persistent state, it's a diff different thing. State is a different thing. So, but anyway, I want to go back to your point because there is a lot of debate here. People are talking about data. Some people are talking about logic. Some people are talking about networking. In my opinion is this triplet, which is data logic and connectivity that has equal importance and actually, depending on the application, you can have the center of gravity moving towards data, moving towards uh, what I call execution units or workloads, and connectivity is actually the, the, the most important part, part of it. So, uh, some people are saying move the logic towards the data, some other people, and you are saying actually that no, you have to build a distributed data mesh. What I'm saying is actually, you have to consider all these three variables, all this vector in order to 
decide based on application what's the most important because sometimes... So the application chooses. That's correct. Well, it, it's what operating systems were in the past was principally the thing that runs and manages the jobs, the job scheduler, and the thing that provides your persistent that, okay, data. Okay, so we, got, we finally got operating system into well. the equation. Thank you. All right. I have a PhD right. in operating system. Okay, because what we're talking about is an operating <laughs> yeah. system. So forget platform or architecture. It's an operating environment. Right. Let's use it as a general right. term. I think that's a better definition. All right, let's take that minute. Neil, I want to ask you a question because I want to give the, because I believe it's an operating system. I think it, it it's going to be a reset refactored, you, you wrote to me, the model of super cloud has to be open theoretical, has to satisfy the rigors of computer science and customer requirements. So unique to today, if the OS is going to be refactored, it's not going to be, may or may not be Red Hat or somebody else, this new OS, obviously requirements are for customers too, but is, what's the computer science that's needed? Where are we, what's the missing, where's the science in this shift, I it's think not your standard OS. It's not like an you know, no, OS. It's, I, I would make really an, an operation, okay, an operation <laughs> environment. Yeah. But the, if you if you think about um, uh, and make analogies, what you need when you design a distributed system, well, you need an information model. Yeah, you need to figure out how the data is is located and distributed. You need a model for the execution units, and you need a way to describe the interactions between all these objects, and it is my opinion that we need to go deeper and formalize these operations in order to make a step forward um, in when we design super cloud and design something that is better than the current hyper clouds. Mm -hmm. And actually that is, uh, when you design something better, you, you make a system more efficient and it's going to be better from the cost point of view, from the performance point of view. But we need to add some math into all this customer focus centering. And I, I really admire um, AWS and, uh, uh, and their executive team focusing on the customer, but now it's time to go back and see if we apply some computer science, if you try to formalize to build a theoretical model of cloud, can we build a system that is better than existing ones? So David, how this do you, what I'm saying. How do you see the operating system of a decent, or operating environment of a decentralized? Well, I think it's uh, layered. Cloud. I mean, we have operating systems that can run systems quite efficiently. Linux has sort of one in the data center, but we're talking about a layer on top of that. And I think we're seeing the emergence of that. Uh, for example, on the job scheduling side of things, Kubernetes uh, makes a really good example. You know, you break the workload into the most granular units uh, of compute, the containerized microservice, and then you use a declarative model to state what is needed and give the system the degrees of freedom that it can choose how to instantiate it. Because the thing about these distributed systems is that the complexity explodes, right? Okay. Running, running a piece of hardware, running a single server is not a problem, even with all the many cores and everything like that. It's when you start adding in the networking and making it so that you have many of them, and then when it's going across whole different data centers, you know, so at that level, the way you solve this is not manually. <laughs> and not procedurally. You have to change the language so it's intent-based, it's a declarative model, and what you're stating is what is intended, and you're leaving it to more advanced techniques like machine learning to decide how to instantiate that service across the cluster, which is what Kubernetes does, or how to instantiate the data across the diverse storage infrastructure, and that's what we do. So that's a very, coin, very good point, because actually what has been neglected with hybrid clouds is really optimization and automation. But in order to be able to do both of these things, you need, I'm going back and I'm stubborn, you need to have a mathemat mathematical model, a theoretical model, because what does automation mean? It means that we have to put machines to do the work instead of us. And machines work with what? Formula, with algorithms, they don't work with services. So um, I think SuperCloud is an opportunity to uh, underscore the importance of optimization and yeah, automation yeah, totally in, in, in hypercloud. And actually by doing that, we can also have a, uh, an interesting connotation. We are also contributing to save our planet because if you think right now we're consuming a lot of energy on these hyperclouds and also all these AI applications, and I think we can do better and, and build the same kind of application using less energy. So uh, yeah, a great point, love that call out. The, uh, you know, Dave and I always joke about the old, because we're old, we talk about, you know, old <laughs> history. OS2 versus DOS, okay? Okay, OS's. OS2 is silly better, first threaded OS, DOS never went away. So how does legacy 
play into this conversation because I buy the theoretical, I love the conversation. I think it's an OS, totally see it that way myself. What's the blocker? Is there a legacy that drags it back? Is the anchor dragging from legacy? Is there a DOS OS 2 moment? Is there an opportunity to flip the script? This is I think that's a perfect example of why we need to support the existing interfaces. Operating systems, real right. operating systems like Linux understands how to present data. It's called a file system, block devices, things that, that plumb in there. And by you know going to a REST interface in S3 and telling people they have to rewrite their applications, you can't even consume your application binaries that way. The OS doesn't know how to pull that sort of thing. So we, 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 to get to cloud, to get to the ability to host massive numbers of, of tenants within a, a centralized infrastructure, you know, we, we, we abandoned these lower level interfaces to the OS, and we have to go back to that. It's the reason why DOS ultimately won, is it had the momentum of yeah. the install base. We're seeing the same thing here. Whatever it is, it has to be a real file system, and not, not a, a Neela, what's your reaction? Because you're on the theoretical I, I think, bandwagon. Let's, let's get your reaction. No, I, I think it's a good, I will give, you made a good analogy between uh, OS2 and DOS, but I'll go even farther saying, if you think about the evolution operating system didn't stop the evolution of underlying microprocessors, hardware, and so on and so forth. On the contrary, it was a catalyst for that. Mm -hmm. So because everybody could develop their own hardware without worrying that the applications on top of operating system are going to modify. The same thing is going to happen with, with SuperCloud. You're going to have the AWSs, you're going to have the, the Azure and the, the GCP continue to evolve in their own way, proprietary, but if we create on top of it the right interface. The open, this is the, why open is That's important. That's correct, because actually, you're going to see some time ago, everybody was saying, remember venture capitalists were saying, AWS killed the world, nobody's going to come. Now you see what Oracle is doing, and then you're going to see other players. <laughs> it's so, funny, Amazon's trying to be more like Microsoft. Microsoft's trying to be more like Amazon, and Google, <laughs> Oracle's just trying to say they have cloud. <laughs> that's, that's correct. So my point is, you're going to see, you're going to see a multiplication of these hyper clouds and cloud technology. So. The system has to be open in order to accommodate what it is and what is going to come. So the, the, the legacy, the so legacy is an opportunity, not a blocker in your it, mind. Yeah. And you see that that's same correct. Well, I think we should allow them to continue to, to, yeah. to be their own. Actually, but maybe you're going to find a way to Amazon's connect the to them. Amazon's the processor, and they're on the 8088. That's correct. Right? That's you're correct. Loving people trying to get, get put that's to work. That's a good analogy. At performance <laughs> levels. You say, uh, right. Good luck, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. We have to be able to take uh, traditional applications, high performance applications, those that consume file system and persistent data. Those things have to be able to run anywhere. You need to be able to to put them onto you know more elastic infrastructure. So we have to actually get cloud to where it lives up to its billing. And that's what you're solving for with Hammers. That's what we're solving right, give for. Me the, Making give me the it possible bumper sticker. It, solving for how do you have massive quantities of unstructured file data. At the end of the day, all data ultimately is unstructured data. Uh, have that, that, that persistent data available across any data center within any cloud, within any region, on-prem, at the edge, and have not just the same APIs, but have the exact same data sets and not sucked over a straw of remote, but at extreme high performance, uh, local access. So how do you have local access to globally shared distributed data? And that's what we're doing. We are orchestrating data globally across all different forms of storage infrastructure so that you have a consistent access at the highest performance levels at the lowest level innate built into the OS, how to, how to consume it. As so are you going into the, all the clouds and natively building in there? So you this, this is software that can run on cloud instances and provide high performance file within the cloud. It can take file data that's on-prem. Again, it's software, it can run in virtual or on, on physical servers, and it abstracts the data from the existing storage infrastructure and makes the data visible and consumable and orchestratable across any of it. And, and what's the elevator pitch for Cloud of Clouds? Give that well, Cloud of Clouds uh, creates a theoretical model of cloud, and um, it describes every single uh, object in the cloud, whether it's data, uh, execution units, and uh, connectivity, with one single class of very simple object. And I can, I can give you a heads up. And that problem that solves is what? The, the problem that solves is, it creates this mathematical model that is necessary in order to do other interesting things, such as optimization, mm -hmm. using SAT engines, using automation, applying 
ML, for instance, or or um, or deep learning to automate all this um, all this cars. If you think about uh, in the industrial field, we know how to manage and automate huge plants. Why wouldn't it do the same thing in cloud? It's the same thing. You, that's you, what you mean by theoretical model. That's correct. Lay out the architecture, almost the bones of skeleton or something. Or, that's correct. And then, and then on top of it, you can actually build a platform. You, you can create your services. Put, you put numbers to it, you kind of index it. You quantify this thing and you apply mathematical. It's really about, I, I, can, I can disclose this thing, it's, it's really about describing the cloud as a, as a knowledge graph for every single object in the graph, a node, an edge, uh, is a vector. And then once you have this model, then you can apply the field theory and uh, linear algebra to do operation with these vectors. And it's, this creates a very interesting opportunity to let the math do this thing okay, for so us. So what happens with hyperscale or like AWS in your model? So in, in my model, actually, are what- Are they happy what, with what, this? Or they, no, I'm like, very happy with uh, that. Uh, so will they be happy with we you? Cre we create <laughs> an interface an interface to every single hypercloud. Well, actually, we don't need to uh, interface with uh, the thousands of APIs, but you know we have the 80-20 rule, and we map these APIs into this graph, and then every single operation that is done uh, in this graph is done from the beginning in an optimized manner, and also uh, yeah. automation ready. That's going to be great. David, I want to go back to you before we close real quick. Mm -hmm. You've had a lot of experience, multiple ventures on the front end. You talked to a lot of customers, you've been innovating. Where are the, the classic enterprise? Because you, you used to sell and invent product around the old school enterprises mm -hmm. with sure. storage. You know that, that trajectory, storage is still critical to store the data. Where's the classic enterprise grade mindset right now? Those customers that we're buying, that are buying storage, they're in the cloud, they're lifting and shifting, they not yet put the throttle on DevOps. When they look at this super cloud thing, are they like a deer in the headlights? Or are they like getting it? What's the, well, what's it, the classic you, enterprise look like? You're seeing people at different stages of adoption. Some folks are trying to get to the cloud. Some folks are trying to repatriate from the cloud because they've realized it's better to own than to rent when you use a lot of it. And so people are at very different stages of the journey. But the one thing that's constant is that there's always change. And the change here has to do with being able to change the location where you're doing your computing. So being able to support traditional workloads in the, in the cloud, being able to run things at the edge, and being able to, to rationalize where the data ought to exist, and with a declarative model, intent-based, business objective-based, be able to swipe a mouse and have the data get redistributed and positioned across different vendors, across different clouds. That, we're seeing that as, as really top of mind right now because everybody's at some point on this journey trying to go somewhere and it involves taking their data with them. <laughs> Guys, great conversation. Thanks so much for coming on. For, uh, for John, Dave, stay tuned. We got a great analyst power panel coming right up. More from Palo Alto SuperCloud 2. We'll be right back.